Good morning. How's it going? My name is John Horgan. Uh, thank you so much, USIP and Resolve Network, for bringing me back. Um, we spoke a few months ago, and if I recall correctly, you, you asked me to talk about everything I think people ought to know about terrorist psychology and reset the priorities in seven minutes. No problem. Here we go. Um, I, I, I really thought carefully about this idea of resetting priorities and what it means and, you know, because there's always a danger of, of, of saying, well, why don't we just cast it all aside and move on and, 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 you know, try to tell a different story. I think there's a great danger in that. So it is critical to take a very careful look at where we've come from and to get a sense of what we have achieved. There are three major themes that I think have, have, have really cropped up time and time and time again in the last 50 years of research on terrorist psychology, 48 years to be precise. What do terrorists have in common, broadly? What distinguishes them from people who don't engage in terrorism? And far more recently, so what does all of that mean? Is there enough for us to pull from what we know about those questions so far for us to use that knowledge in any way that is realistic and actionable? And it's that final question that I really want to uh, focus on for, for most of what I want to present today. This, of course, has been our bugbear, our obsession for the past 15 years. Lots of definitions out there, but by and large, this word refers to the process whereby people change to such an extent that they are willing to become involved in violent extremism. Uh, perhaps one of the most um, um, uh, concise, if not elegant, summations of what we know from that research came from our colleagues just around the corner from here at George Washington University's program on extremism. And this quote really um, is, is, is significant to me for a few reasons. Uh, it's not just because it happens to support my own thesis, um, but they say the profiles differ widely in race, age, social class, education, and family background. And then here comes the understatement. Their motivations are equally diverse and defy easy analysis. The significance of that quote for me is that it doesn't, it, this is not about terrorists writ large. It's not about um, uh, 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 making the statement to apply to the variety of different kinds of groups out there. This assertion Seamus and his colleagues were pointing to is evident even in extremists who wanted to join ISIS from North America. This diversity and complexity, it is what we have found. I've spoken to policymakers, some policymakers, um, who feel that, that this kind of statement, uh, if it is an accurate reflection, is a stunning indictment of us in the academic world having not really made a lot of progress. If, if that's the outcome, then wow. The other view is that, well, that's a very naive statement. Because the other view is, no, this is the outcome of some of the best research we have out there. This is the reality, and we just can't shy away from it. It is diverse. It is complex. That is the nature of terrorism. And perhaps the true challenge, then, is to figure out how we channel that complexity into solutions. Easy peasy, right? Radicalization remains a hard problem for two reasons. Now, I'm not the first person to point this out. Heidi Ellis, Noemi Buhana, and a whole bunch of radicalization scholars have been here before. Multifinality and equifinality aren't just two wonderful words to casually throw into dinner conversation every now and again. But if you want to quickly quickly explain why radicalization will always be a hard problem, use these two concepts, OK? The first, multifinality, is where one factor can lead to several outcomes. All of you who study radicalization will know what I'm talking about here. We're all worried about exposure to violent extremist content and what it might mean. Yes, it might be a factor in leading someone down the road to terrorism, unquestionably. 
It also might lead to protests. It also might lead to mobilizing someone into taking action against this kind of content. It might lead to self-harm. It might lead to multiple different outcomes. The second issue, it might seem similar, but there's a key difference here. And that's when the same outcome can come from multiple predictors. And let's not even talk about terrorism for a second. Let's talk about having radical views or having extremist views. What are all of the kinds of things that might factor into that and fuel that? It is everything from following a certain Twitter account to religious indoctrination to foreign occupation to you name it. I firmly believe that we are in the golden age of terrorism research. I think we have come so far in the last 20 years that we are no longer searching for the drivers of on extremism. We have all of the pieces of the puzzle in front of us. We just don't know how they all fit together. One of the greatest challenges for us in the research world is to figure out the nature of that sequence, the sequence of radicalization and how those bits work. Also faced with the dilemma that the sequence is not going to work the same way for every single person, even within the same group. It's far easier to answer the question of what terrorists have in common. The problem here, and to go back to Michael and JM's presentation at the beginning, is that we get so caught up in the ideology, the content of the ideology, that we miss the bigger picture here. I don't care if you are a violent incel, a member of a white nationalist extremist group, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, even some of the old the Red Army faction, the IRA, this is what you have in common. There is genuine, legitimate, moral outrage at some injustice, perceived or otherwise. It doesn't really make any difference in the eye of the believer. So I mean, you, this, 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 should not be, um, this should not be new to you. Terrorists have to work hard to convince themselves and others that what they're doing is just, it's necessary, and it's urgent. This is one of the um, uh, 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 powerful features of ideology as a mobilizing power, and I mean all kinds of ideologies, they provide an urgency to action. Talk of imminent invasion is very powerful in terms of um, uh, convincing someone that if we don't act now, it will be too late, and, and, and your way of life will be fundamentally at risk. And the one thing that all terrorists have in common, they all believe that their actions will help bring around or bring about a better future. Again, this is, this is across the spectrum of groups. For, for all of the time I've been studying terrorism, I have been loath to think about a, a sort of a, an overarching grand theory of terrorism, but I think if we strip away the ideologies, the content of the ideology, um, we're onto something far more meaningful. Now, resetting priorities. Uh, well, look, the reality is different forms of terrorism are going to come and go. They go up, they go down, whatever metaphor, whatever analogy, waves, or something else we want to use, that's not going to change. I'm not so naive as to think that, especially in the policy world, that there aren't going to be discussions around, well, what do we call our, what do we, what, how do we characterize our responses? Let's call it CVE. Well, let's not call it CVE. Let's call it something else now. We'll call it perhaps PVE. Perhaps we'll call it something else now again, you know, terrorism prevention. To an academic, it doesn't really matter. We're still going to have to address these issues. We're still going to have to come up with uh, actionable solutions. Where I think we really ought to be going is this. And this is, a, this is uncomfortable ground for an academic because we're not used to, I'm, I'm no shame in saying this, we're not used to speaking to policymakers. We are especially uncomfortable at offering imperfect information and imperfect knowledge if we think it's going to be used in some way. And I think that's the thing that we struggle with and I think that, that is one of the things we're going to have to somehow address through uncomfortable but necessary and overdue conversations. This issue of the radicalization process and its sequencing, I mean, I don't know how long it's going to take us to crack that, if at all, but we can't wait until we do. So the question is, what do we do in the meantime? I think it is well within our grasp to identify intervention stages based on what current knowledge and, and tools we have at our disposal. 
A few years ago, with some funding from the National Institute of Justice, um, uh, my colleague Mike, uh, Mick Williams and I found that those best positioned to spot the signs of growing radicalization weren't religious scholars, they weren't parents, they weren't teachers, they were the peers of people themselves. So we spent two years talking to those peers to try to figure out, well, if you're best positioned, why aren't you doing anything about it? And we found that, well, they're actually very, very, people are, peers are very, very reluctant to report concerns about radicalization. I unfairly thought it was because, well, maybe they just, maybe they just hate cops. Maybe they just hate law enforcement. It wasn't that at all. The overarching reality was that this was the reason for this bystander effect had to do with fear. Now that, to me, seems to be a non-ideological, bipartisan grounds for thinking about CVE that addresses the problem in a far more practical way than perhaps we have been uh, alluding to in recent times. And just a simple example that I just put out there to, to say that sometimes we do, we do lose focus on what we actually can do. So thinking about um, uh, uh, anonymous convenience solutions to reporting, to reporting concerns. But here's what I want to really leave you with uh, today. I'm all for resetting priorities, don't get me wrong. But before I simply you know, give you a shopping list of, look, here's all the things I would really love to see funded in terrorism research for the next five, 10 years, I can do that, trust me. These are some of the bigger issues that I think are going to pose us, pose much, much bigger problems for us in the immediate future, and I mean short to medium term future. Um, I, I I'm going to disagree with my learned colleagues from this morning. Um, I see very little evidence that we're taking prevention efforts seriously at all. Certainly domestically, I think we're so far behind, we don't even know it. We are in the midst of not just a national epidemic of extreme right-wing violence, this is, we're seeing a global resurgence in, in, with this. And I don't think we have any clue of just how insidious this really is. I mean, present company excluded, of course. But this is, this is not something that's going to go away. This is something that is, 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 is serious on levels that I don't think we have really grappled with yet. There is decreasing f public faith in both government solutions to this and in scientific answers. People don't want to hear that it's complex. I can't, tell, I can't give you any other story other than it's complex because this is, this is what I do. It might mean that I need to go off and find a different line of work, but I can't simplify the radicalization process in any other way. It is complex, and, and, and that's the reality of it. Um, we're seeing increased polarization and nonviolent radicalization. I mean, this is not, again, this is, this, is, this is surely not news to you. And more worryingly, we are seeing a return to simplistic ways uh, of thinking about terrorism. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? I'm going to, um, I know I'm out of time. I'm going to finish with what I started with. I think terrorism research has never been in better shape. There's a debate a number of years ago in academic circles that sort of seeped out a little bit about you know, whether it, we'd gone stagnant or not. I completely disagree with that theory. I think it is better than ever before. The evidence, the evidence base is better. The quality of data is far, far better than we've ever seen. The question is now how do we move that research, imperfect as it might be, into actionable knowledge. I think that is the challenge uh, before us. Uh, thank you so much.